um, so that there, there might be a bit of time for questions. If you do have questions as we go, um, feel free to just um, type those in um, and uh, I'll attempt to come back and answer them um, at the end. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try and respond to you um, uh, after the conference, after the webinar. Um, okay, so just kicking off, um, if I can get my system to work for me, there we go. Um, the presentation today is on student management systems, your SMS, um, and the title there, Love It or Hate It, um, I think aptly uh, describes um, the relationship that many people have with their student management systems. Um, however, it really is uh, the, the central pillar of an operation. Um, and, and key to, to an effective operation. Um, so just very quickly, Sophie's introduced me, some of the people on the, um, on the webinar already know me, but just to give a little bit more background about how um, I'm relevant in this space. Um, that picture there is my first computer. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the first people in the country to um, to have one, it wasn't actually mine, it was my father's, but um, the screen you can see there is Space Invaders and that's what it spent most of its time doing. Uh, this was back in 1978, and yes, I'm showing my age, um, and we would buy um, we would buy code in a, in a book or a newsletter or something, and you would type it in and save it onto a cassette tape, and, um, and then you could play it via cassette tape, and those are the cassettes there on the side. Um, this is, old school um, and more modern times um, my my initial qualification out of school is actually electronics engineering believe it or not um, and I, I was involved in some computer techiness um, for some time um, over the, the period I've spent in, um, in education, in international education, I've had quite a bit to do with student management systems and have worked quite closely with, with a couple in particular in helping them develop the system and in helping them help me as a, as a, a college um, manager uh, um, run that business more effectively. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm fairly aware of the ins and outs of student management systems. Um, and just thought it'd be worth starting by saying, why is this an important um, area to discuss? Um, I think that it's important, one, because, uh, you know, there's, there is, a, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of passion around um, student management systems in terms of um, people feeling that they're, they're malfunctioning um, and that the, that the developers of student management systems don't understand um, their businesses and what they need and so on. Um, having having uh, played a role on the other side of the coin though with the student management system developers, um, I, I can firmly say that the same is true from their side, that they see the colleges as um, often malfunctioning and that they don't understand how the systems should work. Um, it's also true that they are a massive area of investment. Um, in business as a whole, not just in, in Ellicott or, or education, but in business as a whole around the world. Um, last year, more than $4 trillion was spent on computer systems and infrastructure and software packages and so on. Um, so it's a huge area. And the reason all that's spent is because it can deliver, um, it can deliver a real advantage to a business who, who uh, gets the right systems. Um, so it's a very important area to, to address. Um, now, outside of education, the kind of um, system that we call a student management system would probably be referred to as an ERP, um, which it stands for Enterprise Resource Planning System. Um, and uh, these systems are, are huge systems that kind of play a part in every aspect of a business. Um, now, you know, Manufacturing isn't really what we do in um, in education, uh, but it really in this uh, education space refers more to um, the the operation of the business, managing your your academic side of things, whether it's your attendance and your course progress, or even um, connecting into uh, the the delivery side if you've got um, 
if you've got a learning management system, it might be connected um, or, or run from your student management system in some cases. Um, so what is a what is a computer system? Um, very simply, at the highest or almost simple fundamental level, they're a, a system that allows the input of of data, the processing of data, and the output in another form. Um, so they're really about turning data into information, which then might lead on to some form of intelligence. And what I mean by that is that as you enter a new student into your student management system, you might enter um, their first name. That's one piece of data. Um, that's not really of any value. The, the day of birth or even the day that they start their course isn't of any value. But once you start putting that together or, or having a list of all the students who are starting on that date, you have something that is, is valuable information. And that information can lead to um, lead to, to what would be referred to as intelligence, which can make decisions for you, i.e. we have a lot of students starting on Monday next week, therefore we need um, some extra people to hang out at the front desk to help us with, um, with their arrival. Um, now, the, the real value of, um, of computer systems is in their speed and accuracy. Um, and as much as we might complain that our systems are running slowly, um, if you imagine um, operating everything off paper, um, where you were handwriting or, or typing on a typewriter onto paper, um, producing, say, a starters list for Monday morning, um, would be a monstrously difficult task um, and doing things like sales reports and so on would be would be nearly impossible. Um, so they can process a lot of data and, and, um, and do a lot of things very, very quickly um, and with extreme accuracy. And we'll talk more about that accuracy thing in a minute. Um, and all of that leads to better decision making. You have a better understanding of um, of how to allocate the resources um, in your business because you can see that we have a lot of bookings coming up or, or, or our bookings drop off or we have a lot of students who are under 18 or we have a lot of students from a particular nationality group and all of these things um, lead to, to business decisions being made and if they can, that information can be provided more quickly and more accurately then you make better decisions hopefully. Um, having said all of that, um, computer systems can lead to a lot of uh, a lot of angst, shall we say? Excuse me, while I take a sip of water. Um, a lot of stress and a lot of problems um, and a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. Um, and often we refer to this situation as a computer problem. Um, and I just want to spend a minute questioning that um, that concept of a computer problem. Um, in a lot of ways, we see computers as, um, as simple logic machines, as, as operating on zeros and ones. And to some extent, that's true. Um, and and just, to, just to clarify what that actually means, because I think it's a, it's a fairly ambiguous concept that computers are zeros and ones. Literally, the way it works is um, the most fundamental piece of, uh, of um, of data within a computer is, is called a bit, um, and that is literally a zero or a one. Um, a combination of those bits um, creates a byte, um, and, a, and a byte might be a single character. Um, it might be uh, the letter N, it might be um, the number nine, for example. Um, you combine a, a bunch of bytes and you get a field, and a field might be a student's name, um, as in their first name, it might be their, their middle initial, um, or it might be the student number. Um, you create a whole bunch of fields together and you get a, a, a record, you know, one student's record, for example, and you pile in a whole bunch of other records and pretty soon you've got a database. Um, and um, that database is, is one part of the SMS um, system and what it does. Um, but all of that makes it sound like a computer system is a simple logical machine that um, that should do everything perfectly and accurately, um, that it's all zeros and ones and it's black and white and it's as simple as that. And it's just not true. Um, and even if we just take it down to the field level um, where we look at 
um, where we look at a student name. Now, we have international students, um, students from certain countries um, can spell their names in different ways. Um, we might have different conventions in a particular college. In one college, you might write their, their family name um, in all caps. In another, you might not. You might include a middle name, you might not. Um, if you're manually entering student names, then it's very easy to make a mistake. If your um, student management system has multiple points um, at which you enter the student name and you each time have to manually enter the student name, then there's even more chance um, for, for um, differing versions of that name, shall we say, um, to get into the system, particularly if there's more than one person doing it. This is just a name. Um, Student numbers is another another example. A student number might be um, auto-generated by a, uh, by your SMS. Um, great if they are, not so great if they're not, because then there's errors. And I've seen people literally maintain an Excel spreadsheet um, where it's just got all the numbers and they color them one color as soon as they use that number, so they don't use it twice. Um, but once you start manually managing student numbers, you you introduce such a um, uh, 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 an easy e um, entry point for errors. Um, but as these things get more complex, as uh, we look at the whole record for a student um, and uh, an admissions person entering in um, all of the data manually, maybe following on from what the, the student or the student's agent has put onto a, a paper application form, um, maybe there's information missed, maybe the, the application has been um, created incorrectly, uh, maybe there's multiple admissions staff involved, maybe one of them has had um, training with one person, another with another, um, and they, they follow different um, pictures in what they put in and what they don't put in, how they... Um, all of this, you know, drawn out um, means that a computer system is really part of a social system. Companies have rules and, and policies about how things are done. New stuff come in, old stuff go out. Um, those rules and so on are not followed with um, perfect discipline and so errors creep in. Um, the other side of this is that um, while computers might come down to, to binary, most programs are written in some uh, in one language or another um, and they're typed in by, by programmers. Um, now, an ERP system might have um, more than a million lines of code um, to, to create that system. Um, to give you a, 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 what, an idea of what that might mean, it would be about 18,000 pages of text um, for, would, would be the equivalent of about a million lines of code. Um, now, it's, it's just absolutely impossible um, in, in developing that to create zero defects, to have no um, error within there. And, and you might not notice it. You might never notice it. Um, it might be noticed only in certain elements of your business. Um, the developer might, um, might uh, demand that there's absolutely no defects in their system. It's, it's just not humanly possible. And ultimately, software is a human thing. Um, you know, it, it's it's just not humanly possible, and it's not um, economically feasible um, in most cases of a complex piece of software to to get it to the point um, where there are absolutely no errors. Um, having said that, there there are really three points at which um, computer problems and actual computer problems can can arise. One is these kinds of bugs that I'm talking about where there might be an error in the code. Um, the next, and actually much more common than that, um, generally speaking, is, is some sort of failure. Um, and that might be a failure of, you know, the local power grid goes down, your internet collapses, um, your, your CPU overheats in your, in your system, your hard drive dies or something, and some sort of physical failure that, that causes a problem. Um, and the last one is you. Um, the user, the user entering data, um, uh, taking that data out in some sort of report. Um, and the, the reality is whether we like it or not, 
um, by far um, the, the biggest cause of a computer problem is the user. Um, and, and you, know, you know, obviously there are some software packages that are very poorly written, but um, I, I've never seen that be, to be the case with a student management system. Um, so it, it really does come down to us as a user of a student management system where those errors are creeping in. Um, and they creep in in large part because of complexity. Um, the, the level of flexibility that we take to, um, to operating our businesses in, in responding to requests from agents and so on, you know, this marketing drive for, um, for making exceptions um, for students creates, you know, just incredible levels of complexity. Um, and you only need to look at the pricing um, within Elicos to, to recognize how complex a system it is. Um, looking at the way prices are different based on the number of weeks that a student books, the region that they come from, um, maybe even the season, uh, you know, um, they might pay or not pay an enrollment fee, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's an enormous level of complexity just in, in payments um, and so much more elsewhere. Um, and so we definitely have a problem with problems. Um, and um, in all of the, the, the work I've done with student management systems, um, from using them to, to helping develop them, to, to helping um, bring on a new student management system at colleges, um, this is the, the possibly the biggest issue, um, this issue of problem solving and, and how, um, how it's practiced. Um, and, and just to talk very, very briefly about that, um, the things that are most common are these practices of, um, as this, this little cartoon shows, um, where, where we see a problem and we don't actually do anything to address it. We just kind of hope that it, won't, uh, that it won't happen again or that it will go away. Um, it tends not to be the case. It tends to keep happening. Um, you really do need to actually do something about it. Um, another really common one is, is really superficial fixes. Um, it might be some sort of workaround uh, manually or whatever it might be, but it, um, it rarely actually does anything to, to improve the problem. Um, a really common one, um, and I don't know if my um, uh, face is over the top of that, um, that picture there, but uh, a, a really common one is this issue of um, complexity and student management systems are certainly a complex system. Um, and with any complex system, problems tend to be complex. And with complex problems, there are very, very, very rarely simple, clear answers. Um, the answers tend to be wrong when they're simple. Um, you know, most complex systems and complex problems require a complex uh, solution. Um, Something that, that does happen is this, this level of delusion. You know, as I said, systems are, are a human and social space um, and, you know, people do tend to have their pet hates. Um, and often when a problem does arise, we spend so much time looking at our pet hate that we miss the bigger picture um, and the bigger problem that is surrounding that little pet hate, which might be a tiny little glitch um, in a sea of, of much bigger problems. Um, possibly the, the, the biggest uh, issue that comes out of all of these things um, is what they call in the improvement industry, um, jumping to solution. Um, I'll just take a sip of water. And that really refers to the really common practice and desire, and it's a very human one. When we see a problem that we want it fixed immediately, we have a great idea and we think that will do great, so we do it and we just move on and leave it behind. Um, and it's really, really effective. Um, so what's the answer to all of this? The answer is um, uh, you know, following a proper problem-solving practice. You know. And this slide um, gives, gives some uh, gives one system that you can follow. It's a fairly popular one um, where you really spend some time clarifying what the problem is. Um, and if nothing else, um, this is uh, this is something that would be of enormous value. So when you see a problem, what you generally see is the symptoms. So really clarifying what those symptoms are first, 
before you move on to, um, to gathering as much information as you can around those symptoms, what the root cause of those symptoms might be, um, and actually defining the problem accurately and carefully. Um, then you might amass a whole range of different ideas about how, uh, how you could address those, that, that specific problem. Um, and, and then from those, you might select one or, or more than one of those ideas um, based on, on the cost and benefit and impact and timing and so on. Um, you plan an implementation, you get acceptance from all the people who are involved, um, all the people who are going to be effective, and then you carry it out. Um, now, one little problem with that with that image is it makes it look like you finish there at number eight, um, which is just not true. Um, most of the time, you're you're following much more of a, a cyclic process of um, of creating some sort of hypothesis to a problem, just like the scientific method, testing it and then reassessing the situation, um, and round and round in a circle you go. Um, and I'll come back to this concept um, a little bit later on. Um, but problem solving really should be treated as this, this cyclic nature where you're hypothesizing about what the problem might be and what a solution might be, um, testing that uh, and, and you know, following this process um, of, of multiple tests before you come up with a theory, but also recognizing that that theory is just a theory and, and not necessarily the truth. Um, now, let's say you go through all of those all of those steps, and you arrive at the um, the rather scary point where you think, you know what, I actually need a new a new student management system because um, the problems that I've identified um, I can't seem to find good solutions for, and I've, I've spoken to my system developer and they can't help me, so I need a new system. Um, you're, you're, it, it's a big decision because it's going to cost you a lot of money and you're, you're now needing to, to ask the question of what do I need and what am I looking for? Um, and really it, it's important here, sorry, um, it's important here to, um, to spend some time. Um, it, uh, it's certainly true that this is a point that, um, you, you can, you can um, make some good moves and you can make some very, very bad moves. Um, so this is a really important juncture. Um, and speaking to um, the developers of systems who, who see this more often than anyone else, because for us as an as um, education business operator, we might do this once every, every 10 years, if that, um, whereas they do it, um, they see it happen very, very regularly. Um, and what they see as the key mistakes that people make are a, a real lack of due diligence in the decision making. So people get attracted by um, shiny lights and bells and whistles and nice, um, nice dashboards and so on. Um, people get attracted by, uh, by low cost solutions um, and they fail to, to really look at the technical aspects of, of a system um, and they, they don't um, really focus on what it's going to be like living with that system um, for the next 5, 10, maybe 15 years um, and, and perhaps focus a little bit too much on the purchase process and how, um, how easy that might be. Um, really, it is a, a major investment, just like um, moving to a new premise. Um, you certainly don't want to do it more often than, uh, than every five or ten years. So what sort of things should you be looking for? Well, um, this is a, a, a really important um, uh, thing to spend quite a lot of time on. And there's, you know, all of the things that you that you do with your system, but then there's things that maybe you could do with your system um, that you can't currently. Some of the questions that you should be asking might be, um, you know, obviously, what does it do and, and does it do what I need it to do? And, and that in itself is a really complex question that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but other questions that you might ask would include things like, is it easy to use? Um, does it meet uh, the, the requirements of the industry, you know, regulatory requirements for, for you know, CRICOS and EVETNIS and so on, depending on the sector that your, your system has to work to? Um, how long has the product been available? Um, how long has the vendor been operating it? Um, are important questions as well. Um, 
you know, obviously if, if it's a new one, then, then maybe it hasn't been tried and tested. Um, but I think it's worth um, spending some time investigating the operation because um, you don't really want to jump in um, to bed with a student management system um, organization to find that um, they, they close shop in six months. Um, you know what's their what's their practice with with customization and what's their what's their development cycle like um, is is an important question to ask. Can you can you expect to see things um, progress? Do they have a development team? Um, is it a one man band? You know what's what's the setup there? Um, uh, will it work well with your other business systems? So maybe your your business operates a um, an accounting package, for example. You've got you know zero or mild or whatever it might be, and um, you know if your student management system can integrate with that, um, that would be that would be very valuable at the very least. If it can um, uh, report data in a way that is that is uh, able to be accessed effectively and entered effectively into into those other systems, um, whether it's a learning management system or whatever it might be. Um, you know how how a license fees calculated how much does it cost so it might be uh, a high initial fee and then it might um, you might have a, a, a monthly fee it might be um, an annual one uh, you might pay by user you might pay different amounts based on the types of users so you might pay one amount for um, full access whereas you've got limited access portals for say your your sales team for example um, or your reception team um, and, and they might pay less. Um, uh, how fast or slow is it? And that will be based on a whole range of things. Is it locally um, housed in your server? On, on you know, does it have a, a client-based um, approach, um, or is it web-based? If it's web-based, um, what's your um, internet like? What's their server like? How reliable is it? You know. Um, there's there's questions to ask around the service level uh, commitments that they have in terms of uptime and downtime and so on. Um, is the system specifically developed? Um, I assume I'm speaking only to Elicos people, but is it specifically developed to Elicos? If it's not, how well does it handle and, and what impact does this have? Um, because uh, with with Elicos, we're looking at a, a weeks as our key. Um, most fundamental unit versus a course. So a student um, enrollment being measured in weeks uh, and, and being quite flexible in terms of which which class they're in and so on um, can can create some difficulties for for vet um, vet focused systems. Um, what's the after after sales support like? Um, is is training included and how much? Um, you know, you, you might even look at who the trainers are and, and you know, make sure that you feel that they, they can actually train your, your team effectively. Um, they might offer training, but then have people who, who aren't qualified trainers um, and are um, not really able to, to help you. Um, you know, how, what's the implementation process look like? Do they have a, a set um, uh, implementation project? Um, that they that they roll out every time. Do they have a set number of, of weeks that they can tell you it will take, and so on? Um, you might also want to know about future developments. What what's on the horizon in terms of potential changes? Are they about to shift to a web-based platform? What are the what's what's the next step for their for their system? Um, now beyond that, you you might start looking at the the more futuristic um, elements that that are starting to come into student management systems. Um, you know, and, and it may not be wearable tech, um, but certainly um, I mentioned that it might be cloud-based. Um, it might, I also mentioned integrations, and, and if those integrations are API integrations, then it can make life a lot easier and save, save an enormous amount of work. Um, if it can integrate with a, with a payment platform or a payment gateway, if it can integrate with your accounting systems, um, your learning management systems, you, you certainly, if you're operating a learning, learning management system, you don't want to be enrolling students twice, so integration there will be valuable. Um, you know, does it provide a portal for agents and students to access, um, whether uh, they're accessing it to, to make an enrollment, to check on the progress of an enrollment? 
um, to, to check on student numbers um, for the agency. Uh, they might be a student wanting to check their attendance. All of these things can, can um, lead to operational um, cost reductions and, and speed improvements for your business. So, you know, these are things that are worth looking at. Um, I mentioned online application forms. That's certainly something that, um, you know, I, I would be expecting that you would you would want. Um, and when I say online application forms, I don't mean a, an application form that creates an email with the data in it. I mean an application form that um, once submitted, the data goes straight into your student management system. So there's no requirement for your admissions team to, to re-enter that data. And, you know, obviously it saves a, a lot of time and, and reduces error rates significantly. Um, so there are all these future things. I'm sure there are, there are many more. Um, now, you might have a look at this and think, well, there's, there's, there's so much there that, um, that he's mentioning that my system doesn't do. Um, let's, let's go. Let's, I just saw this system last week that does all of those things. I should do it. Um, really big question. Um, are you ready? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot to get ready. Um, the first thing really that you want to do there is start building out your, your SIPOC charts and value stream maps. Um, and if I'm not speaking your language there, um, it suggests that um, obviously you're not the person who, who would make that decision that you are ready. Um, this is, in my experience, a, a key error that is made in this space um, is that there's a total lack of expertise taken to the process of change. Um, you know, in a in a in another business, I can't imagine um, that this would be done without having a, a professional systems analyst or business analyst come in and build these SIPOC charts and value stream maps to understand the business effectively um, and make sure that um, everything was clear before you started making a huge change like this. Um, and really, what this is about uh, is is clarifying the business needs versus the business habits. Um, now, anyone who's, who's ever tried to improve a system, um, improve uh, a workplace in any way, um, will know the phrase and hate the phrase, oh, this is just how we do things, um, or this is how we always have done it. Um, it's always been done this way here. Um, this refers to a business habit. How you do something is, is completely irrelevant if you're about to change system um, because systems will do things in different ways. So it is really of no interest or value or anything um, how you do things and how you have done things. What you really need to be asking is um, what does our business need? What outcomes are we trying to produce? What reports do we need to, to deliver to people? Um, you know, what decisions do we need to make with this information? Um, so really clarifying what the needs of your business are um, via these SIPOC charts and value stream maps, for an example, is really key. Um, and that's why I haven't mentioned um, process mapping uh, because process mapping really tends to talk about how you do something as opposed to what why you're doing it. And it's really the why um, that's, that's really key. Um, the other element here that you need to, to look at before you decide that you are ready for a change is your complementary assets. Um, you know, if you're going to go to a web-based system, you really should make sure that your web server and that your internet connections are strong and reliable. Um, if you're going to get a new um, client-based system that, that works off your, your local server, um, then you really better make sure that you've got a good local server that's reliable. Um, there's no point um, getting a, uh, a Ferrari of a system um, and, and then, you know, having, um, having nothing to run it on, having a, having a dirt road for it. Um, so you've really got to make sure that you've got all the things in place. One of those assets uh, is is the, um, the the discipline and the system approach of and, and the culture of, of your organization do you have a culture in place where people um, people are disciplined to following set rules do you even actually have set process rules and so on 
um, ways that you that you all do things? Do you do you make sure that you're all staying with that as you bring on new staff or change roles or whatever it might be? Um, that's a really important asset that a business might have is those business practices and, and they're things that you really need to have in order. Um, the biggest one though, as I said, is, is really about making sure you have the right people in front of this. Now, um, it's not good enough to, to rely on your, your IT support guy um, to bring in a whole new student management system. Um, that, that support tech really um, is able to fix network problems maybe if, if they're not too complex, so depending on, on what sort of person you've got there or people you've got there. They might be able to, you know, log you into your new system or, or, or fix some, some minor issues, but um, a, a new ERP um, or a change project for an ERP is a whole different ball game and requires a very different set of skills. Um, likewise, as I've seen quite a few times, relying on the, the, um, the student management system organization themselves um, tends to end in tears. Um, it's really not that uh, not that wise a decision to not put um, a dedicated and, and expert resource against this if you consider how much money you're spending and how much you stand to gain from having um, a, uh, a, a positive outcome. So you make the change, um, you, you sign the line with a new student, sign on the line with a stu new student management system. Um, the first thing off the rank is, is um, migrating your data from your old system to your new system. Um, and this can often be the area of greatest pain. Um, and in my discussions with uh, the operators of student management systems um, who have recently gone through um, bringing on clients from other information systems, um, it tends to be the most underestimated and poorly attended task. Um, your data, uh, you know, is, is incredibly important um, and so it needs a lot of time taken to, to make sure that you're preparing it effectively. It doesn't just magically pop out of one system and into another. Um, the fields that are in one system are going to be different, they're going to be named differently, they're going to be coded differently. So you need to spend a fair bit of time planning how you're going to move data. Um, it can also be very costly actually to, to migrate data from one system to another. Um, and so it's very much worth the time to ask um, what data you will migrate. Um, do you really need to migrate um, the, um, the, the name of uh, a, a student's teacher from five years ago and, and which other students were in that class five years ago? Um, would it be possible just to, to have that sitting in a, in a data store somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of work that um, I think is, is kind of hidden um, in a student management system around templates and workflows and copy. So whenever you, you um, process a, um, uh, a new application, for example, um, and, and you, you, you click submit on an application and it produces a letter of offer, that letter is based on a template. Um, there's coding in that template, and so the, all of those things have got to be set up. Um, the letter's got to be actually written um, as well, so that all takes a lot of time. Um, then you've got the, the UAT, the user acceptance testing, and that's where you have to um, get a, um, what's sometimes called a super user, but um, you're often your most technical um, and, and proficient person from a department to, to test a system, and that can take days or weeks. And so you've got to plan your resources for that. You've got to make sure that you have a person um, set aside who, um, who can, um, can cover for them. Because let's say you take out your most expert um, person from your admissions team, your student management team, your academic administration teams um, to do this user acceptance testing for, for a day, a couple of days, uh, a week. Um, who's going to manage their workload in the meantime? Um, there's also training, so you're going to need to train all your staff and how they use different things. So all of this takes a lot of time. Now, having done all of that and having everything ready um, and you're, you're ready to launch your new system, um, it's really important to recognize that um, everyone is now a beginner in your system. 
all that sort of muscle memory of keystrokes and codes and so on that makes them so fast in using the system that they've used for the last 15 years, uh, 10 years or even five years, um, is gone. Uh, and they've got to think at every point. So everything's going to go a lot slower and you need to, to, uh, to plan for that. Um, all of this obviously can lead to an enormous amount of stress. Um, and so it's really important to plan for that stress and plan for, um, for the, the, uh, the, the impact that that stress will have on the various members of your team, including yourself, um, and, and make sure that you're, you're ready for it, um, but also that you've, uh, you've made the right, um, uh, taken the right steps to, to minimize it. And finally, you have a new system um, and you've got to use it now. As I said earlier, there's no such thing as a fault-free system, and systems are social as well as um, as well as automated. Um, so there will be problems. It's important to recognise that problems are problems. Um, I've always hated that phrase. Problems are opportunities. They're not. An opportunity is an opportunity. A problem is a problem. Problems need to be fixed. Um, you know, they they need to be addressed. Uh, if if um, uh, if if they, they're, they're causing um, significant loss. Now, some problems um, cause insignificant loss or, or, or difficulty or so on, and so might just be ignored, but others not so. Um, and it's really important when you're addressing problems that you go to root cause. Don't just look at the symptoms, and we talked about that process of, of, of problem solving earlier on. Now, with problem solving, um, and, and this is the same and, and the reason why um, systems aren't uh, error free. You've really got to balance this countermeasure versus solution approach. Um, and what I mean there is that solutions are when you make the problem go away, it ceases to exist because you've found the root cause and you've stopped that happening. All right. Um, a countermeasure is, is where you do something so that it's maybe minimized or maybe um, you you avoid it being being a problem for you, um, you know. Um, and in a lot of cases, solving a problem um, might be uh, might be overly expensive and just not um, not possible. You might not have the technical resources, and, and you don't have the ability to pay for them. Um, and so, a countermeasure is necessary. Now. What I would um, warn against there is um, overuse of countermeasures. So I've seen um, a few schools that um, spend more time using Excel um, to, to do the tasks than they use the student management system. And if that's the case, um, you really need to spend a bit more time on solutions. Um, Excel really is a countermeasure that you're not getting um, the uh, the single system solution out of your your SMS, um, and so you're using Excel to um, to make up for that. Um, in certain cases, that might be fine because it might just be a lot easier, um, but in other cases, um, it can create all sorts of difficulty. Um, one real difficulty is when you have multiple sources of the truth. Um, and that really means that you've created a spreadsheet and you start to store data in that spreadsheet. Um, and once you start doing that and you're not necessarily updating it as regularly as, as the, the, the SMS is updated, um, then you can, you can have um, differing data in each system. And so two versions of the truth um, and the wrong version might lead to the wrong decision. So it, it really needs to be um, carefully decided that you will use um, a countermeasure like Excel, for example, rather than actually solve the problem. Um, right, and uh, that's the end of what I have to, to talk about specifically. So I'm just going to scroll through. If there's any questions, feel free to um, to shoot them in. Um, I can see what I can do about answering them for you. Okay, so if anyone has any questions for Ian, you can type them into the chat box and press enter. Um, 
Ian, someone has said, just out of curiosity, what's the most commonly used SMS in Ellicos? Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, I would say that there are four or five systems um, that are commonly used um, in Australia. Um, other systems are used in other countries. Um, I think the the most um, the most commonly used systems are systems like eBCAS, um, RTO Manager is becoming increasingly common. Um, Stars is another common one. Um, there are there there are a, a few others. Intrinsic has just moved um, to Australia, so that was operating in the UK um, until recently. Um, there, there's a few other systems, um, smaller systems. Some some organisations have their own as well, and a bunch use um, uh, use either a vet system or um, a, a homemade hodgepodge of of Microsoft Access and so on. Are there any other questions? If there's no other questions, um, uh, but if you have a specific question that you'd like to, to ask about, if you need a um, to discuss a specific issue or a difficulty that you're having. Um, my email's there on the page, ian at ieinitiatives.com. Um, feel free to shoot me a message. I'll happily help you out um, if I can. Um, if, uh, if there are specific things that you'd like to talk about offline. Okay, well, there are no other questions coming through. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Ian, for um, presenting today's session. So it was uh, excellent food for thought, um, as one of the people who attended the session has sent through as a comment. So thank you very much. And, um, you know, your wealth of expertise is very valuable. So thank you for sharing that. Cool. My pleasure. My okay. Pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Okay. Bye. Oh, so you have a comment, Ian. Uh, we love you, Ian. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, you can, I'll, uh, I'll. I, I get think that that's positive. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.